Hi everybody, welcome again to another live session. Now today I'm going to go through how I start to apply all the feathers on this uh, little wren. I've already got the background washes on and the iron obviously the beak, so they're already done. But I'm going to go through how I kind of create all the layers for all these feathers that I put on the paper. Okay, so just stay tuned and I'll show you how to do that. Now I've got a question for you today. So what's your biggest challenge when painting birds in watercolour? So let me know and I'll be quite interested to find out. So I'm just going to pause that a minute because I've got it playing elsewhere. So let me know what, you know, what is your, uh, your biggest challenge when painting birds in watercolour? What do you find hard? What do you find difficult? So uh, just post it down below, either in the live chat or the description below, below the description, the main comments section, and uh, I'll answer those questions later on for you, okay? Now then, right, here we go. Painting the wren. Um, now I'm looking at the photograph. Now the photograph is a cracking one by well, a very good photographer called Ben Smith. Now Ben, if I just bring up his details there. There you go, Back Garden Bird Studio. Facebook.com, Back Garden Bird Studio. So you can find him on there. He's a cracking photographer, as I say. Very nice chap as well. Um, well worth kind of following on there. Okay, right. Other than that, I'm going to look at the lightest layers first of all. So I'm going to go straight into a little bit of raw rumber. And I've only got one camera on today, so I can't quite get the one in focus properly with all my playing around with the cameras and settings today. And I want this more to a... Uh, um, let's say more of a watery consistency to begin with. I'm going to be using my size double zero brush. Now, all I want to do, all I want to do, is have a little bit of fun by adding in this lightest layer. Sorry, can't help it, can't resist it. First of all, and you can use your size double zero brush or anything that's got a decent point on it to start thinking about the first layer of colour. And when you're building up these layers, you've got to look at the direction these all go in. Now, I've already got the pencil marks in there, as you can see, on the paper. And the reason why I do that is because I want to make sure that I can still see these once I've got the watercolour washes on the top. But to do that, to stop them washing away, all I need to do, really, which is what I've already done, is put a little bit of paint over the top of the pencil marks and it kind of seals that pencil in most of the time, not always. And because it seals that pencil in, I can still see where these little marks go. So you got me live for one hour today. Um, so after that one hour, then obviously if you want to post any additional comments and you're welcome to down below. So if you're watching this on catch up, not a problem at all. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button down there. All right, so when I do go live, and I give all these tips and tricks away, which is what I want to do today, then at least that way you'll be notified when I'm live or when I put another video on, okay? So click on subscribe, then hit that bell icon once you've done that because that is very, very important because then you shouldn't, hopefully, fingers crossed, miss anything. So you can barely see these marks going on. I can thicken this down a little bit if need be, but I don't want to go too, too thick too fast. I don't want to go too dark too, too quick, if you know what I mean. Because if you do, if you make a mistake, then you find the hardest correct. It's easier to kind of correct a mistake when it's paler, okay? So just remember that. So when it is paler, you can easily kind of correct those mistakes a little bit more. Um, I'm just gonna just check something out on my phone just to make sure that I can play what you're listening to as well. few more down there. I'm just looking at the reference photograph while I'm doing this. A little more down there. Now, with all the marks I'm making here, as I say, I want to keep them light, but also I want to keep them very fine, very thin. So when I'm loading my brush, I'll load it in there look like that. And as I load it, I'll pull up the side, give it a twist, a few twists as I pull away, just to load that brush up. And then I'll get some kitchen roll and just give it a quick light tap. Just once will be enough normally. Sometimes twice if it's too overloaded, but that just ensures that the tip of the brush is nice and fine. Because if it's not, you find that you get these big blob marks. I'm sure you've all done it. I've done it, I still do it now. 
you know, when you get the big blob marks on the um, on the brush. So let's have a quick look there. Uh, a few more around there. Let's have a quick look. So we're working our way around the head. As I say, just a palest colour. And I'm overlapping these lines as I'm doing this as well. Because what you've got to think about with all of these things is that when you're painting wildlife in general, when I'm working with watercolours, which I do all the time, my members on, on my Devon Artist site will know that anyway, you know, all I paint with is watercolours, um, is because every layer of detail you add, the feathers or the fur, whatever you're painting, be it a dog, cat, mouse, ant, whatever it might be, will get deeper and deeper. So you could feel much more kind of formed and there'd be a lot of depth within that fur or feathers in this case of course. So you have to work slowly with the radio on, a little bit of nice music, a little bit of Elvis Presley or anything that you want to listen to as you do so. Oh, uh -huh. are you lonesome tonight? And then you can relax into that painting and it's all about kind of relaxing when you're working on something like this. And, you know, one thing I do a lot when I'm painting all these little details is smile. I don't know why, I just do it. I, it just puts a happy thought in my head. Oh, look at that, you see? Guess who didn't dab his brush then? See what I mean? That's how easy it is to kind of make a little mistake. But I've always got a piece of kitchen roll in my hand, as you can see here. And by doing so, at least that way around, you know, I'm ready, ready and waiting in case there's a little blemish or a little spot of paint which gets onto the paper. I'm going to switch to a little bit of raw sienna. Now you can see I've got my colours mixed up, ready to go. So I've got um, uh, raw umber, raw sienna, burnt sienna, burnt umber. Got a little bit of phalo blue, okay, which is the same as the intense blue within the Windsor Newton Cotman range. And we've got phalo blue and lamp black in there. This is just a touch of cadmium orange with a tiny amount of burnt umber. And this is a very dirty looking colour and that's basically raw umber and lamp black to a very watery consistency. And I've already used those when I'm working on the eye and the beak. Okay, which I can do something very similar as another live session at some point as well. So we can work on that. But I mean, don't forget as well, if you want to learn how to paint a, a bird's eye and a beak, um, then you find I do have, I'll tell you what I do have actually, I do have um, a, um, a playlist for you if you're interested on how to paint a robin in parts and bits and bobs, okay? So have a look at the card, I'll pop up above for you after this has gone live. Can't do it obviously whilst I'm live. And uh, then you can have a look at that and then play that back and go through the playlist. So anything to do with kind of eyes or fur or anything like that, I'll pop in little cards for you as I'm, as, as I'm going to mention them, okay? Right, so I want to pull a few of these very fine ones just out of the back of the head. And what I'll do today, I'm going to show you as much as I can on the, on the feathers, on this layering technique, on how it all kind of goes together. And I'm going to show you my special brush. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll show you my special brush in a bit as well. The one I use to get a lot of lines on in one go. So stay tuned for that. Okay, now I'm looking at the direction these lines go in at the same time. So I'm just switching back to the raw sienna now. A little bit too much paint on that, Paul. And the raw sienna needs to follow the same lines as the feathers. Now, even though the body of this uh, little wren is not quite the same colour as this. I will be using watercolour white, which is this one here. Okay, it's an SAA one. It's the one I like to use. Um, just, I've, just like it, I just like the paint. There's just something about it. I've used it for quite a few years. Not so much the same tube, because I've gone through quite a few of those. Um, but it's, just, it's an opaque white and it's fairly thick as well, which is quite handy which you find. Now, if you've got any questions you want to ask me while I'm live, please post now. If you've got anything you want to know about the materials, the paints I use, uh, the brushes I use, the paper, um, me, I'll oh, forget about me, but anything that you want to know about, okay, within the arty 
kind of watercolor world that I do here for the wildlife side of things. Okay, so this is just that, as I say, that very pale layer. I'm going to add a little bit more to the top of the head. So I'm going to show you how to do as much as I can today. And then I'll do a little bit offline before I go live again. And when we come back to you again, then obviously we're working on the, the further details and layers on this little wren. Now this is the European wren, because I know that the European wren is a little bit smaller from what I can gather um, than the Carolina wren over there in the States. Lovely, lovely, lovely um, kind of bird. And I think the actual eye stripe is a bit wider and bigger on that bird as well. Which is why this one's not quite as big. Now, I'm going to switch your colour a little bit more. Now when I mark up, because when I work out the different shades of colour, what I tend to do, I've got a lot of kind of testing cards, I'm just going to stretch for them in a minute. Things like these, these are all paintings which I've used for, for tutorials when I used to teach in the local village, village hall here. And I can use the backs of these for testing on. And they're very, very handy to save old paintings that you want to throw in the bin, don't throw them away. If you're going to get rid of them, keep them. Okay, because that way, then you can use these for testing on and just kind of test your colours before you go to your main painting. I've painted a lot of wrens, so I know the colours I'm going to use for this, but if there's something you're not familiar with, test those colours out first. It's very, very important. You must do that. Because otherwise, if you make a mistake on the painting, it's not always that easy to fix, is it? Okay? So just bear that in mind. Um, let's have a quick look on there, see what's happening. Oh, we've got 17 people. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching today. So just a few more down here of this raw sienna just a few more um, I do like using this double zero brush now so this one is a Winsor Newton one which I tend to, which I've used for years or oh, this brand anyway not this particular brush and I get on so so well with it I really do I think because it's it's not sable this is a synthetic brush and it's got quite a good bounce rate on it as well. It doesn't mean that you throw it against the floor and see how far it bounces back up again. Shall I try it? No, no. Basically, all I mean by that is that when you get your finger, preferably clean, which mine are for change, when you pull the bristles back like that and you flick it back, that's your snap rate or bounce rate, okay? So the quicker the snap rate or bounce rate, then you'll find the more control you'll have on a smaller brush. That's what I tend to look for with a small brush. Whereas if you've got a brush where it takes its good old time going back, you find, in my eyes anyway, it's only way my own experience, I mean, I've been doing this for a fair few years, that um, I can't control that that well. But I suppose it all varies to different people, doesn't it? Right, I'm going to switch colours a little bit more now. So what I might do is go for, where's my mixing brush there? Which is an old acrylic brush. A little bit of the burnt sienna. I've already got some burnt umber just in there. I'll pop that in there to get some burnt umber in there as well. So burnt sienna, burnt umber. Again, I don't want it too thick. So this is going to be more of a uh, probably milky consistency I'm looking for for that. So that's like a rich coloured brown is what I'm looking at. Okay. So burnt sienna and burnt umber. I'm going to start around the eye first of all. This is going to be not so much the mid tone yet. We're not that far in yet. So this is going to be more for like um, just the next layer of a pale light tone really. I'm going to start just to the right hand side of the eye. Look how pale that is. I know you can barely see it. Just to the side there. Okay. And I'm going to gradually build this up just bit by bit. Or if you do fancy painting um, a free, well, how many videos have we got? One, two, three videos. We've got, if you go to my website, Devon Artist, down below at some point, not yet, as and when, watch the video first today, obviously. And you can join as a free member now. We're skin with, well, my partner, Joe, said, which is very clever, isn't she? So you join as a free member. And when you're a free member, you've got access to three different videos with the outline drawing, the reference photograph, 
um, that you can have a go at painting, okay? Some videos I produced, because you know I've got about 60 videos on there now, which my members um, obviously watch and paint from, so so you can have a look at that. So just go pop down there and just sign up as a free member and then you can have a go at those. And there's no commitment, so you just obviously just got to put your email in, that's all you need to do. Right, okay, so I'm just adding this colour just to kind of enrich the colour on the top of the head a little bit more. And it will gradually change the way this looks, just bit by bit. Um, again, I'm looking at the direction these go in. Now, I tend to think about brush directions as a, well, I suppose like a clock face, really, is the way I do it. Because when you're looking at a clock, I mean, this is going, I'll put it this way, okay. These lines are going more towards eight o'clock, okay? from two o'clock to eight o'clock, two o'clock to eight o'clock. And then they switch as they come around down here, all the way around to about 11 o'clock, then yeah, 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and then round towards the beak. And then round towards the tip of the beak. Okay, one second. Yeah, yeah, got that. Um, so, working down here now, Just looking at that bit and that bit. I'm trying to think about the direction these all go in. And there's like a fan shape around like that, around the front of the beak. And this is just those undertones. Wasn't that a group? I think it was a song group, wasn't it? Singers on the undertones, anyway, beside the point. Um, so these are the undertones, which we need to put all the harder, the thicker, the darker details over the top. more down there. So look how much different this has gone already compared to everywhere else. Now the top of the head as you can see on the reference photograph is definitely darker anyway which it certainly is. So we have to just bear that in mind. Um, we've got a question from Kim. Hello Kim. Um, Paul have you used the blue in the highlight in the eye? If so which one? The blue I used was a mixture actually it wasn't what I thought. It was phthalo blue. So phthalo blue with a mixture of cerulean blue or cerulean blue, depends how you pronounce it. So phthalo blue and cerulean blue, and I did that to a milky consistency, okay? So that's what I used for the highlight in the eye. And then over the top of that highlight, I used a tiny amount of water color white, just to kind of give it that extra sparkle, okay? Hi, Moira, how are you today? <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Okay, so carry on. Um, and then a few more just down there and underneath the beak. I don't look too dark underneath there because it's more of a grey brown tone just underneath there. So I'm trying to ease off now that little bit on the, you know, the, the stronger colour which we've got here at the moment. Now I did say I'm going to show you one of my, <laughs> a special brush I've made and it's called my replicator brush. Now I don't know if you remember years and years and years ago. When we were at school and we did something wrong, we used to, well, I did anyway, used to do lines. I know, we have to write, you know, lots and lots of lines. I must not stamp my feet or whatever you might do. I used to write with two brushes together to get two lines in one go. Cheating, I know, but I did it. But that's when I was at school. Now, what I'm getting at is that I've made what I've called a replica brush, which will do more than one line in one go. So in this case, <laughs> I know you're laughing about this. This is the one in question. So I'm going to show you a video on that in a bit, okay? So when we get about halfway, I'm going to show you a video on how I made that. So stay tuned and I'll show you what I did to kind of create this uh, little, just get a little bit more paint on there, kind of replicated brush. And that, as you can see here, let's just show it on some scrap paper first so you can just see what I, so it stands out a bit more. That will create quite a lot of lines in one go. Now you can buy one similar to this. But I'll say I'll tell you all about that very shortly and how it all works um, if you don't want to make your own. Right, so I'm going to add a few little lines now just down here. And I said I don't want to go too dark there because that's more of a grey kind of colour around there. But I'm always, always looking at the angle, looking at the direction the brush strokes go in or the direction the feathers grow. So think about it that way if you find it easier. And by doing so, 
All you need to think about is not just the direction, but also, roughly, the length of the lines. Now my lines are gradually overlapping in places. Just so it kind of knits them together as, you know, kind of add these details on. But look how quick this is going on, just to this first layer. Now I only use this for the first one or two layers, but, um, you know, I like to use my double zero brush, and again, I'll tell you all about that in a bit. Okay, I'm working way back to the head. I do want to bring some more details out the back of that head as well, so I'm going to wash that out. I'm just looking around the back of there, see how this is quite a, a strong line here, so I need to think about um, the details there. And I need to soften that line first of all, so I'm going to come in with a damp, clean brush. Just damp and clean, not soaking wet though. And just lightly lift that edge. And by doing so, what it actually does, make sure you don't get a run on your metal ferrule there, look. It just softens down this edge that little bit. Just a small amount. Just take that harsh edge off the paper there. And you can see, I don't know if you can see this on the camera, the kind of colour just pulled off there on the tissue, on the kitchen roll. And then that then, once this is nice and dry, will enable me to kind of put more lines over the top without, without having, I can't talk today, without having that hard edge on the end of it, which you don't want. And to do this, just a damp clean brush, as I say, and tiny little circles, little twiddles, little tiny circles as you come around. Lightly press it, and then lift it off. And then you've got a nice softened edge all the way around there. Not too worried about where the wing starts, because that's a little bit darker and sharper on the details. But I'll just let that dry, and once it's dry, we can add a bit more detail over the top of that. Okay. Now, I just had a few more of the same mix of the burnt sienna, burnt umber, down to here first of all. Again, look at the direction the lines go. Something like that there. Look. There we go. Okay. I've got a pesky fly here at the moment, just buzzing around, so you have to excuse if you're here on the microphone. <laughs> That time of the year, hot and clammy weather outside, I know. Right, and just down to there. And I'm going to switch colour in a minute. I'm going to go for a little bit of burnt umber on its own, first of all. It might be a bit dull, so I'm going to try it first. See how it's dried in my palette there already? Just on that side lot. Because I've got very warm lights here, so it will tend to dry quite quickly. A tap and I'm going to start down the side of the eye so this really is going to be for mid tones I'm going to do all this the same way further down but I'll do that off camera to a certain degree but when I go live with you again I'll probably work on the wing and the tail and show you how that works and even if there's time after that one how to use watercolor white as well all right so you have to watch out for that so that's why you've got to click on that little subscribe thing down below so you don't miss out and as you can see, I'm just trying to look at the direction that's going all the time. Now my eyes are flicking towards that reference photograph every few seconds. Uh, they really are. So I've got my um, tablet, which is like your iPad, just directly in front of me up, up above here. And um, just on my table. And I can see that I've got it zoomed in. Very large photograph. Thank you, Ben. I've got it zoomed in all the way through to the details. And when you've got a large photo, you can really kind of pick out those, um, those really finer, finer details that you can see. Um, yes, more of a very warm day where you are as well. And Kim, been thunder and lightning in Herefordshire. Yes, it has here actually, not today, yesterday. We had thunder and lightning. But not, not a mass amount of rain, but thunder and lightning here in North Devon. Now I'm looking at the kind of rough length and direction of these lines. And you see how tiny these are? So very, very small. Overlapping. And again, all I'm doing with the lines, was that a bit of paper gone? I'll over exaggerate it on purpose so you can see what I mean. All I'm doing with the lines is overlapping gradually like that. Okay? Instead of having them kind of parallel with one another like so, just overlap them. 
So it's basic elongated crosses really is what you're looking for to give us some general idea how that works. And that's what I tend to do, but I'm doing it quite small indeed for this. And you do have to be careful that when it starts to get lighter, I'm just looking around the back of the head. So it gets a bit lighter around the back of the head there, so I want to ease off those details a little bit there. Just a small amount really. The thing with watercolours, we can control it. You can, honestly, con control it. I know people think, oh, you can't control watercolours. You can. It depends on what you're painting as well, doesn't it? If you're a, a landscape painter or a seascape painter, then yes, it's tricky because you're doing a lot of large wet and wet washes. But when you're working with wildlife, apart from the backgrounds which we do, we don't do any really large kind of wet and wet washes. Not really large ones as such. Unless you're doing like an A2 or A3 size, uh, A3 size commission portrait of a dog or cat or something like that then it's you have to go quite large with the brushes but um but in this case you don't need to so because of that you've got much more control over the water and where it goes and remember that water will only go where it's wet so where you wet the paper that's where the where the water and the color should I say not the water where the color will go is where the where the paper's wet um so you have to remember that when you're working on this so you're in charge. Now there's a lot of lines around the side of the eye here. Just at those. And the one there. And I want to dullen these down a little bit now because they're a bit too bright and white. Just a little bit. And this is just burnt umber on its own at the moment. More to a milky consistency. And as I said, this is all I'm using, just that little bit there. I keep stealing some of that from there putting it into the dry area. Now I use ceramic palettes and the reason why I use ceramic palettes I find that the paint settles nice and flat so when it dries you can see here for example it's dried lovely and flat whereas I find with it's a, if it's a plastic palette it tends to I don't know it goes in like a bubble of water doesn't it and you can't quite see where I like to see where the colour goes so I like to see if that's, that's what it's going to be like with a few layers of the same colour on compared to you know two or three layers or something like that there see what i mean so when you've got something which is dried like that it gives you an idea an indication of what it will look like with more layers on so i do like to use ceramic palettes um, and you don't have to buy special ones like i've got here you, you can just use um, a white saucer from the kitchen cupboard anything like that as long as you find out make, make sure you've got permission to use it first okay <laughs> Uh, anything like that and you find it well I find the paint settles as I said much better on there compared to plastic of course I do use plastic palettes for when I'm using masking fluid which is a little bit different okay so again I'm looking at the directions these are all going in just a few more directions there and these are overlapping quite a lot around here and the change in direction now towards more nine o'clock ten o'clock direction on the paper and you can see how this is gradually gradually building up just be careful around the back of the head make sure we get these directions right there as well because they're a little bit too sticking up there this should be more towards three o'clock and nine o'clock about that way i think then it starts tilting down towards four o'clock. It's getting that late already. Oh, it's gone past that time, isn't it? And then with a nearly dry brush, I just added a few little extra details around here. Just a few. Oh, starting to form. So you can see the benefit that you get just by working with just very light layers and taking your good old time doing it. And you should never, ever rush it, never rush a painting. And my members know that, so you should never ever rush a painting because if you do, then you find that, you know, you, especially when you get near the end of the painting as well, it can be a little bit of a pain because um, you just want to get it finished and you shouldn't really get to that stage. So if you get to the stage near the end of a painting, you're oh, I'm going to get this finished now, you know, and you feel like you're rushing it a little bit, just step back, walk away, come back five or ten minutes later after making yourself a cup of coffee or something like that. And then approach it with a more calmer, less, 
uh, way of thinking where you want, want to get it finished. Just think, I want to enjoy doing this. Um, because uh, that's, that's how I find that's tricky to do. Even now, say after 40 odd years of painting, I still, I still find it tricky at the end. When you get close to finishing a painting, you just want to get it done. And then just see it finished. And hopefully with a smile on your face. <laughs> okay, just underneath the beak now. Not the arches. And then down the front. Yay, look, it's coming together now. So a bit more burnt umber again. Now I'll tell you what I'm gonna do actually. I'm gonna just water this down a little bit more. Just in one corner. And that's because the part I'm gonna paint next, I don't want it too thick, this brown. So burnt umber. Pull away, remember, roll it, pull away, give it a tap. So roll it, so load it, roll it and dab it. And then start to add what should be a paler color. It's a little bit better. Just a more watered down version on this side as well. So I need to dullen things down as I mentioned now. Now we've got that bright color underneath. I need to make it a little bit duller. Because that bright color will still show through to a certain degree. Yeah, that's a good thing about watercolor, it is a transparent medium mostly, which it is. And that allows you to kind of have the white of the paper show through the paint. And really kind of make that paint glow and stand out really well. Yeah, that's better. A few more down there. Okay. Right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm planning on working on the next layer just after this, which will be the next darker layer. Not the darkest, the darker layer. And I'll show you how that's going to work. But first, I think what I might do is get a quick slurp of coffee. So I've got a cup of coffee down here. Going cold in one of them stay hot mugs, but it's still going cold. But I mentioned to you, what I'm going to show you is a little video, which is two minutes, that's all it is on how to make my little replicator brush. I know it looks rough, but you see how well it works. I've already shown you that. So just stay tuned and I'll show you how that one works and how to make it okay. So uh, I'll be back literally in about two minutes time once you've had a quick look at this. Well, hi everybody. I just want to show you what I'm doing at the moment. I'm kind of working on this large A2 commission. Of a dog, obviously. <laughs> Nobody guess that. Um, I'm using my old brush. Now, if you remember, this is one I've, I've been, well, I've told you about before, where it's an old brush, which I was about to throw in the bin, and I thought, oh, hang on a minute, I could do with working out a method of trying to do quite a few lines in one go. And this is ideal for doing the underlaying details, if you know what I mean. So the first one or two layers of detail, before you put the final layer on the top, I'd use this method. It's great for getting three or four lines in one go. So if I just kind of reload that a minute for you. You see what I mean? So I can get quite a lot of lines in one go here for the face, the first, as I say, first and second layers. Um, the only thing with something like this is that they can be far too symmetrical. Um, so that's why I do the final layer with the normal kind of detail brush. If you remember, that's my double zero, which is this one here. So Winsor Newton Cotman, series 111, and um, as I say, double zero in size. So I'd use this method, as I say, for the first one or two layers of detail and then I'd kind of lightly wash in between each layer as I go along. But it does help, it kind of helps build up for the, especially a large portrait like this as well, just to kind of get those lines going and get them on. Um, but uh, as I say, all I've basically done with this one, got a pair of pliers, so it's an old brush, got over the side of it like that and kind of poured it and crimped it out. And the same on the other side, just on the edge of it, poured it and crimped it out. So it kind of splays it like a fan brush, really. The rake brushes you can buy um, on the market are fine. I say they're called rakes. Um, but again, they're very symmetrical and all the lines are like in the same kind of direction all the time. Okay, so there you go. That's my own little version of uh, sort of a rake brush where you can get a lot of detail down in one go. So I'll see you again soon and some more tips and tricks videos. Bye for now. Well, there you go. That's giving us some ideas how that works, doesn't it? Hey, do you enjoy that? Yay! So now you can see what I mean by this replicator brush and how simple something like this is 
and the fact, obviously, that you can buy something like that, which is the same kind of thing. And this is one by... Let's have a look. Oh, and they went into song then. Rosemary & Co. And it's a Coma Brush Series 2230. There you go, it's a quarter inch. So that does the same kind of trick, but I've just made my own from a brush I was about to throw in the bin. Okay, right, so that'll give you some ideas what I use when I'm trying to get a lot of detail on quite quickly to begin with, without rushing, of course. Remember I said about that. And give us some general idea. Okay, right, carry on. Oh, hola, Mogliar, hola, buenos dias, buenos dadas. <laughs> right, I'm gonna go a little bit more. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go back to that burnt umber. And I'm gonna start adding a bit more now towards where the eye stripe is, just there. And a few inside it now as well. You see what I mean in a bit? I'm gonna try and stay on as long as I can for you today. So just a few more in there, working as another layer over the top of the same color. That's all I'm doing. Even though the chest area down here is quite pale, when you look at that reference photograph, you see what I mean when you look deeper into it. If I just bring that a little bit bigger for you, so you can just see that. Look at that. So you can see right underneath the chin. There you go, there's my finger. Right underneath the chin, you can see how pale it is under there. I'm going to be changing the colour of my painting to a certain degree to not quite match the reference photograph. I'm going to get you know, my version of it. So I quite like the browns on some of the ends. And photographs do vary, you'll find as well, from place to place, from photographer to photographer, from camera to camera, to even down to the device that you view the photograph on and the light itself as well. So just bear that in mind with photographs, you know, you don't have to paint them exactly as you see them. So it's just kind of worth just noting that. <clears throat> oh, Margarita, and also, what's that say? Pacalito. Uh, that's beautiful painting is it thank you very much indeed very kind of you right uh, a few more around there now then I'm gonna go for a darker color just for the 20 minutes we have left I'm gonna do that now to do that I'm gonna go for lamp black and burnt umber so I'm gonna, these are my half pans, by the way. They're, these are the ones that I tend to use every single day. Um, I, I stick mostly to the same colors. So I've got my color chart, which I make up as well. Just worth doing that, by the way. Make yourself a little color chart of the colors that you use most of the time, your kind of sort of go-to colors. And then you can use that as your little reference card as well. I also use that, by the way, when I'm looking for um, a particular color. So I'll kind of try and match this up to the side of the photograph. So, oh, that's near the same one, that raw umber there. And, and that one's near the same one for the eyes and so on. So use this as a little matching card as well to a certain degree. And it can help you work out the colors you need to mix to kind of get the color that you want, all right? So it's well worth just making yourself a little color swatch card on, and uh, obviously with the, uh, the paints that you tend to use the most. Now, as I mentioned, I want to go for a little bit of burnt umber. I'm gonna get some fresh, I think, and I might just pop it into here. Get some water using my little pipette. So I've burnt somber, and I want this now to a creamy consistency. I know, it's going dark, it's getting darker all the time. So creamy. Keep going. Now the brush I'm using for mixing, <clears throat> just out of interest, this is um, an old, 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 old acrylic painting brush. That's all it is. I've had it for many, 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 many years. In fact, I think I had this brush before I was even born. So it's that old. And this particular one, even the, <laughs> as you can see, there's no paint left on the handle. And there's a little bit of silver left up there. Look. Um, and I used it solely for mixing. It once had a point on that. But because it's an acrylic brush, it's really handy for mixing because it's a stiffer bristle brush. Yeah, try saying that. That's not quite easy, is it? And I'm going to go for a little bit of lamp black and add that in there as well. Oh, look at that. Wow. That's dark. Too dark. So how do we change it? We'll put more burnt umber in there. So wash your brush out. Bear with me off camera. I'm going to get some burnt umber. A bit more burnt umber. 
I'll tell you what I might do actually, I still want it to be a dark colour, but I'm going to get a little bit of burnt sienna now. <laughs> so I'm just working this up in my mixing palette here, there we go. Oh, look at that, that's lovely. What a lovely colour that is. Ah, oh, lad. Hey up, hey up, duck. Right, so that's going to be, I'll show you that colour actually. That's going to be this one here. That's nice, isn't it? So burnt umber, lamp black, and burnt sienna. And that's watered down version, see what I mean? So that's a nice, rich, kind of browny black colour, which is what we want. Now, I don't use black paint on its own, okay? I try not to because of the fact it can look very flat when you use black paint. So just be careful with that. If you do use black paint as I do, which I tend to use lamp black, which is my favourite black, um, then just make sure you add a colour to it. And the kind of colour you add depends on, obviously, what you're painting. So in this case, I'll add brown which makes sense, doesn't it? Because it's a brown bird. It's a little brown jobby. So because of that, you know, obviously stick with the brown kind of tones within your mix. If you're mix making something which has got a cold colour, you know, um, if you're mixing it for the dark within the eyes, for example, in this eye, use a little bit of phthalo blue with a lamp black within the eye. So that's because it's a cold colour. So I've got went for blue. Um, so just bear that in mind when you're working with this, just either warm or cold. And uh, that way around, you should just about get it about right. So this is not the darkest colour, but it's a darker colour. So this is this is um, more of the darker mid-tones. Because <laughs> we had so many layers, it's difficult to say, you know, light tone, mid-tone, dark tone. No, there's more than that in between thing with layers as well, you can add as many layers of paint as you want to add within the detail side of things. And as I said, the more layers you add, the more detail you create and the more depth, the, um, the, you know, the coat of fur, feathers, whatever it might be, will look at the end of it. And you can also stick with the same colour. So once this is dry, I can go back over the top again with that same colour. It's got a very fine tune around the eye now. Uh, so if you've got any questions you want to ask while I'm live, you're more than welcome to ask away. Because you got me for another about 15, 15 minutes or so. And uh, so while I'm live, just grab me now. Well, you know, in a nice way, of course. And very lightly now, flicking, barely touching the paper. So two hairs in the air, that's all it is. Barely flicking it, tiny marks. And I'm creating like a fan shape as I'm coming away from the, from the eye. So again, it's doing that sort of kind of shape along the, uh, the edge here. So think about it that way, like a little fan. I do find a lot of birds' faces are very similar as well when you're working with a, a bird. And, and the way that the feathers are constructed, the way that they tend to go. Um, and I painted obviously a lot of birds over the time and they are quite similar in the direction of the lines. Not always, because obviously the, the heads all vary in shape and size and things like that, but, but the actual direction of the feathers do vary. So I want to show you the, the head, as I said. Now you can see this really pulling together. Now we're getting this next layer on. And I say it's all about working from light to dark. And because we've got these other layers underneath now, you will also find that you need fewer lines the darker layers because you've created the lighter paler areas underneath and those paler areas you'll be adding just a few little marks in between here and there just kind of create a little bit more depth in the paler areas but very lightly and you'd only do that with a, a semi-loaded brush so a brush that's just about ready for kind of reloading with paint before you load it go down to areas which are very pale and then utilize that paint what's left on the brush hardly any lot within those areas and then that will give you the finest brush marks as well. Okay, so carry on. Creamy, creamy consistency. Overlapping all the time, and I'm constantly looking at the reference photograph, as I said earlier on, which you need to do just to get these little details for the top of the head. You can see the way the layering's working now. Just 
very lightly, barely touching. And I'm going to pull a few little ones as well out of the top of the head. Not many, because it's not a, it's not had a bad hair day, has it? So it's you know we all have it this time of the year at the moment. But well, apart from me, of course. But um, because of that, there's a few little tiny ones just sticking out the top. Very tiny ones. Um, and then coming down the back of the head. Now it gets paler down here, as you can see in the reference photograph. So I'm going to add just a few, as I mentioned down here, just a few odd ones sticking out the back of the head. <laughs> There's a few odd ones there. And again, I'm looking at the direction these lines are going in. Barely any paint on the brush. Just a few here and there. Just add those little darker marks in as well. Yeah, it's coming together and it's starting to. Now there's obviously a lot of paler patches around there as well. Okay, right, so that's that. Now I'm going to go for a little bit more black in that paint, I think. I won't go in for another layer of the same. I'm just going to put a little bit more. Lamp black, just in one corner. Something like that there, like, okay. Oh, bit of a water blob there, so let's get rid of that. Before it drips into my paint and weakens it down. Okay, now then for the darkest colour. Here we go. You ready? No, I'm not. Yes, we are. Now I'm going to start off around just the edge of the beak and just see where this little detail goes. And just tap this in. I don't want to paint a straight line so it looks like it's got a bit of a smile or, or a bit of a sad face really. So just tap that in otherwise you'll have too straight a you know, defined edge. And then start looking at where the darker marks go just on this side, just on the left hand side of the eye, thinking about that fan shape all the time. There's a little tiny kind of rope curls around the eye. Constantly thinking about the, the shapes that you can see. A few more down there. And underneath the old chinny chin chin. Looking lovely, thank you very much, Kim. It's very kind of you. And just a few odd ones. See, so nearly dry brush again. Remember that? So this is where I can start to think about any odd ones that's coming away underneath the beak. And then into the, the white of the background paper. The background paper white. The white. Um, yeah, okay. Just around there. Okay. And then I'm going to look at, this is the edge of the eye, and then we've got this area here which is darker. This is when you start to really focus on the details on the photograph. You know, this is when you've really got to kind of zoom in and look at everything you can see in there. Because by doing so, you can really pinpoint where these little fine lines go. Now I can give you another little tip if you're interested. Shall I give you a tip? Okay, red rum, ask it, 10 to 1, no. I'll give you a tip and all it simply is, is little cards like this with squares cut out. Okay, look at that, aye aye. Now all it basically does is that I'll have two of these, one on the reference photograph and one on my painting for the area that I want to paint. And what it basically does, if you've got a very complicated looking animal you're painting, say for example, let's say, let's say a golden eagle, anything, okay, where there's lots and lots of detail within the feathers or anything like that. With these little cards, you can isolate one little area that you're working on, or big larger versions, put them in a circle, whatever you want to do, triangle, heart, love art, I don't know. But then you can work on that one little area. So your eyes always focus on straight onto that part of the photograph and onto that part of your painting. So a little tip for you, so you can isolate certain areas. Just use some bits of card, anything will do, as long as it's clean, to go on your painting, of course. So it's well worth doing that, because how many times have you looked up to the photograph and said, oh, where was I, where was I, I can't find where I was. <laughs> what part was I working on? <laughs> I still do that now. 
So that's uh, something I tend to do. I mean, that's the beauty about a tablet or an iPad or something like that, is you can just zoom into that one area and just maximize, you know, those little details, which helps in the same kind of way. Now then, do you do that? Is that something you use? Do you just use your iPad or tablet to zoom into a photograph? Do you print the photograph off? If so, then, you know, do you make sure the colors are about the same on the printer? Because very often they're not, I know, because I've tried, you know. I used to work from a printed version of a photograph, um, but um, I prefer now working from the uh, from the tablet because I can see the true colours or from the photographer's true colours. So, do you print your work off? Do you print your photograph off? So, just put a little comment down below. I'd like to hear about that. It's quite interesting to find that out. You know, how do you look at your reference photograph? There you go. There's a question for you. Okay, now I'm just adding the next layer of, of the same color all the time. I'm still going into that dark part of the mix. I'm still working into here, into the blacky browny ready color. So basically, if you remember, burnt sienna, lamp, lamp black, and burnt umber within there. And now I'm gonna add a few little ones into the eye stripe or supercilium. There you go, it's getting all posh and knowledgeable, isn't it? Ooh. And then down below the eye, it's getting darker and darker all the time. So I'm just turning the lights out. No, no, the, the bird's getting darker, Paul. And a few little ones just down the side there. Moira, I print and try to adjust the colors. Yeah, not always the same, is it? But yeah, it's a good idea though, Moira. You can do it that way around. As I said though, with all photographs, just make sure that you're aware that they do vary. Because I know I've spoken to quite a few people over the time um, regarding photographs and how they look. And they say, well, it doesn't look quite the same as yours or mine doesn't look the same as my photograph and so on. But they do vary. As I say, it depends on the light, depends on the camera, depends on your device you're viewing it on. Because colours vary, as I say, from computer to computer, to iPad, to tablet. They all vary, very often they do, in contrast and colour and saturation, saturation. Can't get the words out today. So if it's not quite right, don't worry. As long as it's near enough, that's all that matters. And don't forget, birds um, change, you know, their colours over the years. You know, when they go into molt or anything like that, they, they do change the colours as well, so to a certain degree. Breeding season, they use a very vibrant, very often. And there we go. Right, now what I'm going to do is very lightly soften this down using a size 5, size 5 brush. And that's all it is, look. So I'm going to wet the brush, that's fully loaded, drip, drip. And I'm going to drag it through some kitchen roll and twist at the same time, so it's just lightly damp. And all I do with this is very lightly skim in the direction the feathers go over the details. I just want to soften them that little bit. If you overload that brush, then you find you just blur that detail away and you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. And by doing it this way as well, that means it will dry very quickly. And when it's dry, then you can work on the next layer or in our case, we're going to add a little bit of watercolor white over the top of that. A little bit round there and just to soften that down keep washing this brush out as well because all you're simply doing if you don't this will get all obviously covered in paint and you'll end up moving paint from one place to another so keep giving it a quick rinse out in your water pot now I've got a, a split water pot so it's got two sections in it I can't really show you on the camera at the moment but it's got two sections on there so dirty is one side clean on the other maybe I can show you on the camera one second without dripping it on the paper there you go so I can wash it in here first, dry on some kitchen roll, look how dirty that is now. That's just during this session. Now. Then wash it again in the clean. And by doing that, I know I've come back with a nice clean brush just to lightly do this with, barely touching the paper, just to soften those details. Okay. Uh, Kim, I've been working using the reference on my phone lately. as printed kaput. Well, you probably find the colors might be better on your phone. 
But on my phone, I find the colours a little bit too over bright um, for some odd reason. But you know, there you go. Away, if you're interested, white gouache as well. Uh, you can use as well um, acrylic white as well, but there's a big difference there, so be careful. Right. Found from that. Now I'm going to make this to a creamy consistency. And my painting board is on an angle. I work on a slant, so it's more angled towards me. And because of that, I tend to put the water at the bottom and the colour at the top. So that enables me to drag that water up and then mix as much as I need, rather than flooding the entire paint with water. And then finally I've got to add more paint again and then use even more paint and waste paint. And so just a little tip for you. If you haven't got an angled board, just put something underneath this so it just tilts it a little bit. So you've got water at the bottom. Okay, now then I'm going to start off just underneath the eye. Just add a little bit down there. And thinking about the shape, now with watercolour white, you've got to be careful not to use too much. Because if you do, it can start to look a little bit, a little bit on the false side. Um, and you can tone it down afterwards as well, if you wanted to. So you can come back over the top of this with a colour, but you have to do that in one fell swoop. So just one touch of paint, barely touching it with a colour. Once it's dry though, you've got to let it dry first. Okay, so a few more. And just down to the bottom. I'm trying to flick this out. I don't want to overload this brush. So this has taken about an hour to build this up, hasn't it? I've already painted the eye and the beak, I know, but for the feathers, to give us some general idea on how long it can take. And it probably, to be honest, if, you have, if I wasn't live or uh, recording any video, which I normally do as you know, then therefore you find, it, you probably do it quicker than that. But again, there's no rush. <laughs> Just remember that, there's no rush. Okay, now still keeping to the creamy consistency, because I want it nice and bright white. I don't want it overloaded though, so I'm trying to be careful of it at the same time. I know a lot of people tend to have issues using white paint, because I've had a lot of reports from the people you know follow, and they tell me that um, I can't quite get it as bright as I want it to get. One, it can depend on the white that you use, and it can also depend on how thick you've got the white paint. If it's not thick enough, you find it will fade and go dull when it dries. And then all you need to do if that does happen, let it dry, let it go, let it go, uh, let it dry, and then once it's dry, you can go over the top of it again. See how bright white that is, and that's nearly, it's really creamy. And the way I look at that is that if you can paint a straight line without it breaking, it's about right. If you paint a straight line, it keeps breaking all the time, it's too thick. And this is very white, and if it's too white, when I come back to this later on, then what I might do, just tone it down with a little bit of raw rumber, over the top just to kind of uh, finish it off really and let's just do a little bit around the front as well tiny tiny marks here barely touching the paper so this is little stipples little fan shaped marks barely touching as you can see flicking out and doing this kind of create more of a kind of tapered line with the brush A little bit more there. Okay. And just some more around there. And then we can work around the area further down below or to the right hand side of the beak, really. Overlapping the lines. So we're following the same procedure, really, that we've done for the darker layers, for the brown layers, really, by doing these elongated crosses, remember? But also, while you're doing that, look in the direction they go. For example, here, they go more towards five o'clock. So think about that clock face. Just remember that. And I'll give you some general idea on how kind of all this works. Right, okay. A little bit more around there. And I think that's enough for that area. Right. Anybody got any last minute questions? a lot there, a little bit more there, 
Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just add a little bit around the front as well. So you can see how this white paint works just by taking your time with it. Now, as I say, there's a variety of white paints on the market, so really be careful what you buy. Make sure that you do get one that's definitely opaque, not semi-opaque or semi-transparent or anything like that. It's gotta be opaque in, uh, in color. Otherwise, you'll find it won't cover very well. Okay, right. Other than that, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put a little um, card at the end of this once it's gone, after it's gone live. And I'm going to show you a little video which has been on here. It's an old, old video which you might find of interest actually. So you find the sound's not quite the same as the sound here. But it works, it's fine. On how to paint a feather in detail. Okay? So um, have a look at that and you'll see what I mean by that. If you want to learn how to paint a feather in detail, then that's one worth watching. If you want to paint your birds, your birds, and learn how that works. So you want to just have a look on the end of this video and you find how to do that. Right, and I think, other than that, that'll do for today. I'll try and go live again next week at some point, if I can. So watch out, so make sure you click on that subscribe button down below, please. So do that now while I'm talking to you. Go on, go on, go on, please. Do it now. Click on subscribe and then that little bell icon, just that one. That's the one, yeah. You got it, yeah. And then <laughs> you'll be notified when I do go live next time around, okay. I want to put another video on. Right, okay, until next time around, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you for watching again today. And uh, I'll see you next time. Okay, see you all. Bye. Oh, Eddie Burke, Paul, where do you sell your paintings? eBay, Etsy. There you go, Eddie. <laughs> so, right, Kim, see you all. Bye. <laughs>